Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to our listeners and to the class. Bismillah rahman rahim Today we are continuing with our series Dawa ilallah and looking at the sciences of comparative studies. Because comparative studies is not just confined to comparative religion. It is a study of all the sciences. So it's not just related to what a person's belief system is. It also include mathematics, biology, history, geography, archaeology. So we're going to, inshallah, if time permits us in this series, look at some of the other sciences as well in looking at how to do dawah ilallah to those people that we meet. We are going through the book, which is entitled Dawah ilallah, and our brother uh, Shi is going to continue with the book from where we left off last week. So we are now moving on to the points that are required for a da'i. First, why is dawa necessary? Second, what is dawa itself? Third, some characteristics of a da'i. And fourth, some useful means and techniques of dawa. So this is, inshallah, what we'll be going through in the series. We're going to be going through four major points, and they're very important to it. We understand it. What is the necessity for doing dawa? Why is dawa necessary for us? What is the benefits that we will gain? What are the reasons for doing it? I mean, you know, everybody is calling. The whole world is calling. You know, if you look at the media, they're calling you to watch CNN. This one's calling you to watch Al Jazeera. Everybody is calling something. What are they doing? They've got a reason for it. CNN is not just pushing out information, or Al Jazeera is not just pushing out information for fun. They're doing it for a reason. So what is the reason behind it? In the same way, when we look at Dawa Ilallah, why is it necessary to do Dawa Ilallah? What are the requirements for this? And the second issue that we're going to be looking at is what is Dawa itself? What is Dawa Ilallah itself? So we touched a little bit on that last week. And then some of the characteristics that we are required to have as the Muslim Ummah who are responsible for calling people to Allah. And then some useful means. And even though it says technique in the book that is written, we're not going to spend too much time on the technique. But some of the useful ways of doing dawah that are acceptable in the Sunnah and the Quran. What is acceptable to Allah? Not our own techniques, not our own fashions or, or fads that are going on at the moment. Can you use social medias? Of course you can. Or can't we? What is the ruling? What is it that we are told? Can we use television? Can we use the radio? All that will be dealt with in that period. And of course, this is the biggest issue in our time. Uh, can we use the medium that we're using right now? Is it permissible, isn't it? So this is what we'll be doing in the series. So the first section that we're going to look at is why is dawah necessary? And so in this book, the author states in the following quote that dawah is necessary for the following reasons. So let's continue. First, why is dawah necessary? Let us first understand the meaning of dawah ilallah. Will you stop there, Jazakallah Khan? Now, last week we looked at what dawah is. Dawah is to invite to cause, not to preach. Because sometimes we have the idea that dawah is preaching. And we said last week that it is dawah ilallah. It's calling to Allah. It's calling people, inviting people to submit to the one true God. That's what the aim of dawah ilallah is. You can move on to the next part of it. The meaning of the word dawah in Arabic is call or invitation. The meaning of ilallah is towards Allah. Thus, the meaning of the full phrase is invitation or call towards Allah. So this is the importance that this author has put in the book, and it's very, very important that we get this, highlight this. The only reason that we are doing dawah is to call to Allah. It is not for name, claim, and fame. It is not so that you will become a celebrity and can sell more t-shirts with your slogan on it. It's not so that you can sell pens and, you know, the, the fads that you see going out, clothing ranges and all sorts. And the idea was supposed to be teaching people how to do dawah, but it's become a, a commodity. This is not what dawah is. Dawah is not for you to become, to have a clothing range. It is to call to Allah. And we have to ask ourselves, some people will say, but we're doing this to raise funds for our organization. Alhamdulillah. Good. There's no problem raising funds for your organization. 
But if it no longer becomes about dawa and it becomes about the slogan, then we have a problem. Then we have a serious problem. So we have to know, we have to understand that it is to Allah that we are calling. We are not trying to market a new brand. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. So we don't have to go into details there. But if your heart is for dawa, then you will go for it. I have asked many people sending me emails or sending me text messages and they say, I think I should do dawa, but I don't know if I should. Then you know you shouldn't. Because your heart should be hot. It should be boiling. You should not be able to stop. You need to have that desire. It's not something you can force. It's something that will be natural. If you are sitting there going, I don't know, I'm not sure, then you're not ready for it yet. And then you must go and sit with somebody so they can teach you more about Islam because you haven't got that boiling point, hasn't been reached yet. Because the minute it starts to reach, if you put a kettle, imagine the old days, you put a kettle on and it started whistling, then you know the water is ready and you can go make tea. When you start whistling, inside of you, you can't help yourself and it comes natural and it flows from inside of you because it's from a, a realness, a genuineness. Then you're ready for da'wah ilallah. Allah says that after books had been revealed and prophets had been sent to preach the truth, people transgressed and differed among themselves. The main causes of these transgressions and differences were the desires to... Okay, so we're going to look at the different uh, things that led people astray. What were the desires that they followed? And we find that after the different prophets had been sent to mankind, over the years, thousands of prophets might surprise many of our listeners that maybe you, you're not a Muslim and you're tuning in and you go, but I only know about 10 or I only know about 12. There were thousands of prophets. There were prophets sent to each people in each time. But when the messengers came, people took that truth that was revealed to those prophets and they corrupted it in one way or the other. And so the final messenger of Allah was sent to mankind with the message of truth. Now, a lot of people, when we talk about truth, they will say, there's no such thing as truth. Because your truth and his truth and my truth are all different. So there's no such thing as ultimate truth. Yes, we can agree to a certain extent that on an understanding of what we see on planet Earth in our very human, finite ways, you could say there is no ultimate truth amongst the philosophers. But amongst the things that are greater than the human mind, there is an ultimate truth. If I drop this pen, ultimate truth tells me that gravity just worked. We can philosophize about it. We can argue about it. But the fact remains that something greater than our philosophy makes this ultimately true that it was pulled down by gravity. Whether you want to call it monroity, make up your own word for it, the same results took place, cause and effect. And by cause and effect, we can scientifically give calculations. We can use any word we like to call it, but we call it generally gravity pulled it down. It is a cause and effect issue, science. If you want to call it something else and you want to call it faith that pulled it down, it doesn't matter. The same effect took place. And so when we consider ultimate truth, there is an ultimate truth. Just because you don't want to philosophize it as ultimate truth doesn't mean that there isn't an ultimate truth. There are ultimate truths. And so, inshallah, when we go through this, we'll find that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, along with all the prophets, came with ultimate truth. And the points that this author writes in this book, he brings them up now, he goes through these different points, and he gives reasons why truth was distorted or why truth was not accepted. And most of them can be summed up in one word, and that is desires, our desires. Isn't that the thing that destroys everything? If we think of life, if we think practically right now, your desire to have that car, you will fight with your wife, you will fight with everybody, you want to have that car. If you want that car and you're going through your midlife crisis, you will get that car. And so your desires override your logic. Your desires often sometimes override what you know to be true. Remember, we are saying that every single person was born with what? Common? Common sense. Desires override your common sense, often. And so as we will see what this writer of this document on Dawah Ilah, he speaks about these different points. But first, before we go into that, we need to take a break. And when we get back from the break, we will continue, inshallah.
Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back from the break. We are continuing with our series, inshallah. Bismillah rahman rahim So before the break, we were talking about how the author who is writing this very, very accurate book and gives a very spiritual depth to the topic of Dawah Illah. Sometimes when we are attending or doing Dawah courses, and I'm just as guilty of this, sometimes we tend to be too secular in the teaching of a Dawah course. And it's criticized when somebody wants to be scriptural. In other words, when they want to use text, that it's boring. And inshallah, we will show you that being textural, following the text is not a boring thing. It is something that is actually exciting and illuminating and gives us an accurate reflection of what the deen of Islam should actually be. When we base all our beliefs on what the text says, not the other way around. Many people in the world have gone into error. If we look at the predominant religions in the world, they've come up with an idea and then go, oh, let's see if we can find a text that will back that up. And we've gone into error that way. If the text does not say it, then don't do it. You cannot manipulate a text to have that in it. And this is why in Christianity today, there are 30,000 madhabs. 30,000. Can you imagine? We've got four in Islam when we have problems with each other. I mean, we put our hands here and the one goes, no, 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 you must put your hands there. Another one says, no, you must put your hands there. Imagine 30,000 variations. This is what it would look like. You go, what? And you wouldn't go near. And it's because of desires. Because of their own desires, they have manipulated and changed the text. They wanted it to mean this. There's a classic example before we go on and see what the text says. Where the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, is narrated to have said according to the biblical narrative. Not, we don't agree that he said this. But anyway, there's no harm in this text. Where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. And Christians will often quote that to you and say, this is what the text means. It says that unless you believe that Jesus Christ is God, you cannot go to heaven. Is that what the text said? Or is that what you're interpreting the text said? There's no evidence that he said that. He simply said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you follow my teachings, I'll show you how to get to God. Isn't that what every single prophet said? Isn't that the teaching of every single prophet from the first prophet to even the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Follow my teachings and I'll show you the way to truth. This studio that we're in now has a door at the back of it. If somebody took that door away and threw it away, it's gone, sitting on a dump somewhere. No one knows where the door is. Does the whole building collapse and fall apart and everything just shatters and goes, oh, it's over. No more. We can't survive. The door's gone. Oh my. What do you do? Just get another door. The building remains exactly the same. So when Jesus is saying, I am the door, he's the door. He's not saying, I am God. I am the building. He's simply saying, I have a message for you to follow. In the same way as all the prophets said. We do not worship any of the prophets. And so it was the desires of human beings to manipulate text that they went into error and interpreting what the scripture said instead of reading what the scripture said. And you know, there are people that say, you literalists. I'm very happy to be a literalist. I am excited to be a literalist. And if that is a criticism, well, I accept your criticism happily. Because at least I know I'm not interpreting something that is not there. We are allowing the text to speak for itself, whether it be for us or against us, whether it hurts or whether it heals. We can't have our own interpretation. So let's continue and see the points that this doctor has in his books as he discusses how people have transgressed because of their own desires. First point. First, show and enforce one's wisdom. Second, seek power. Third, raise one's flag over the others. Fourth, remain stubborn in one's opinions. Fifth, defeat and destroy one's opposition. Sixth, and acquire wealth. These in turn led the people to design, practice, and preach. A, new beliefs. B, new philosophies. C, new rituals of worship. And D, new codes of life. Okay, Jazakallah Khan, Sheikh. 
Now, if we look at this, it goes and shows us the recipe for failure. We can apply this not only to nations and to religions, but we can apply this to our own lives. When we start to innovate, the destruction of Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Taoism is when we start to innovate. The minute we try to innovate, everything starts collapsing around us. When we try to add in what is not there. And so he speaks about the different desires on how nations fell, how different religions fell because of their own flawed wisdom. First of all, the first point he says, they enforce their own wisdom, their own flawed wisdom, I would add to that, because there's nothing wrong with wisdom. Some people, if we look at Christianity, it appears to us when we read it, if we read the book of Genesis, that in the narrative explained in the book of Genesis, that the God of the Bible wants his people dumb. He doesn't want them to have a brain. He wants them to be good and dumb, to remain stupid. If you believe that narrative, what is the sin that man does? According to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, when Shaitan is supposed to have come to Adam and Eve and done the whole narrative that you see and written in the Bible, they wanted to gain knowledge. So the sin was them wanting to gain knowledge, and God did not want them to gain knowledge. So he cursed them and wanted to keep them dumb. That's if you believe the biblical text. We don't believe this. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is power. So wisdom is important, but flawed wisdom is dangerous. When we are in Islam, we are to ask as many questions as possible all the time. We never stop asking questions. But once that question has been answered, you do not go back again to that question. It's now been, khalas, it's done. It's sorted. The answer is there. You don't need to go back. You know, sometimes during Ramadan, we have these people come and they ask questions. And they ask, is it permissible to that? You say, yes, it's permissible. No, it's not permissible. And they are happy with it. Tick it off. Next year, they come with the same question again. Or they're doing it on purpose, waiting for that one sheikh to say that the haram is halal or the halal is haram to suit their own needs. I remember one brother phoned me once. And he phoned me about an issue. He said he had a fight with his wife. I'm sure you've all heard this one before. He had a fight with his wife and he said, I divorce you. And they asked me, am I really divorced? So I said, yes, you're divorced. And he said, but when I phoned this other sheikh, he said, I'm not. So I said, how many sheikhs did you phone? He said, about 10. So he was trying to wait for until he had like six, four, five against or whatever it was. And then he'd be happy with his result. So this is what we often do. We want to make haram things halal and halal things haram. Halal will remain halal till the end of time, and haram will remain haram until the end of time. It's not going to change next year just because you want it to change. It's going to remain the same. So with information that is given to us, if we are told this is the ruling, and we have the proof, and we have the evidence, and they've backed it up with verses, and they've backed it up with hadith, then you have to accept it. Then you move on. You don't come a year later and go, yeah, but that's when people are going against what is being really taught to them. So we are gaining wisdom and then we stop. We don't have to go back and ask that question again. So this is also, we will find many, many times people go into error, religions go into error, institutions go into error, is they start second guessing or they start doubting. So we say seek knowledge, but once you've got that wisdom, accept it. Don't keep coming back to that thing. The second desire is that they look for power. This is very big. Many other people ask me, why don't Christians accept Islam? Why don't the priests? I mean, these are learned men. They know all the faults in the Bible. They've seen the 20,000 errors or the 100,000 errors. Surely they know because it's a power thing. Many of them are afraid that if they had to become Muslims, and it does happen, that they're going to go all the way to the bottom. They're going to lose their power and they're going to have to start all over again. And they're not going to have that 10% wealth that they were getting from everybody that came to their congregation. And they might become poor people. And they might have to lose that Ferrari and that timeshare and that other house that they have on the coast. It's going to be difficult. So sometimes we are afraid that we're going to lose power. The flag that they raise of self-righteousness is the next point that he talks, that they have over others. You know, I'm going to dominate you. You can have that idea of someone planting a flag and they come into a land and they say, I'll raise this flag in the name of the United States or Britain or Pakistan or India. There's that same concept that people 
have gone into error because of a flag trying to dominate another culture or another group of people. Sometimes it's because of their own stubborn opinions the writer speaks about. He speaks about how their own stubborn opinions of themselves. They're full of themselves, in other words. And then in point five, he says that they sometimes will try to destroy the opponents. And they call these opponents their enemies. Anyone who gets in their way suddenly becomes an enemy. And we can see throughout history many occasions where wars were started, and then they were claimed to be religious wars, but had nothing to do with religion. The religion was brought in at the end of the decision. First, it was a political decision. It was an economic decision. It was trying to steal land, and they needed something to back it up. And so they'd say, oh, we're doing this in the name of the cross. Or we're going to do this in the name of Buddhism, or whatever it is, whatever ism it is. The religion was the last thought. They used that as a catalyst to doing things, so you'll find that. And the last point, often it is wealth. If I was writing this, I would put wealth at the top. Wealth is the biggest reason that many people stay away from truth, because it's more convenient to follow a lie because there's more money there than to follow truth. Imagine you're a director or you're a producer and you're having to choice between making a Hollywood movie or Bollywood movie and doing something in Islamic work for Islam. Which one is gonna pay you more? Not Islam. Not going to pay as much anyway. So there are many temptations that come our way that we have to deal with and many temptations that we've seen that nations and religions have gone into corruption because of these six points. So these are things that we can apply to our own life. We don't have to only look at them in the context of religion. Well, we've run out of time. The time goes fast. So tune in again next week, same time. So from me, Arib Islam, and the panel that are here with me today, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.